Well, if you've been in our Wednesday evening Bible study, you know that we've been looking at the book of Judges. And I asked Taylor to read Judges chapter 2, verses 7 and following, because that passage basically encapsulates the message of this particular Old Testament book. And we're going to key our lesson this morning on a statement that is made in the 10th verse as the writer talks about a generation that knew not God. This passage is talking about the passing away of the generation of Israelites that Joshua led into the promised land and, and what happened afterwards. Just a few decades earlier, God had sent Moses down to Egypt to demand the release of his people from Egyptian bondage. And those familiar with Old Testament history know that God sent ten plagues to convince Pharaoh that he needed to let Israel go. Pharaoh was stubborn about that, but finally God got his attention and the Israelites left Egypt. They journeyed to Mount Sinai where God gave them a law and made them his special people. And then the Israelites, about a year later, journeyed from Sinai to Kadesh Barnea, and spies were sent in by Moses to spy out the land. And I, I'm sure you remember that ten of those spies came back and said, although the land is everything that God said it would be, a land flowing with milk and honey, we can't take the land. There's walls around the city. There's giants in the land. Sadly, the people of God believed the report of the ten spies. They didn't listen to Caleb and Joshua. And as a result, they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years until that older generation, everybody 20 years old and older, died in the wilderness. Well, it was that younger generation that Joshua led into the promised land. And this passage tells us that that generation remained faithful to God until the death of Joshua and the elders who outlived Joshua. But then there was another generation coming behind that generation that did not know God. The inspired historian tells us in Judges chapter 2 and verse 7, So the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua, who had seen all the great works of the Lord which he had done for Israel. But then verse 10 says, when all that generation had been gathered to their fathers, another generation arose after them who did not know the Lord nor the work which he had done for Israel. As you think about this Bible passage, and especially about the, what the writer tells us about this generation that came along that did not know God. There's three things that we want to do in our study together this morning. First of all, we're going to look at lessons that we can learn from this passage. And then we're going to think about what it was that may very well have contributed to or caused this apostasy. And then finally, we'll bring our study to a close by considering the question, how can these lessons be applied to us today? 
as you think about the lessons that we can learn from this passage. I think this passage clearly teaches us that apostasy can engulf entire generations of God's people. In other words, apostasy is not just something that can happen to individual Christians here and there. It is something that can sweep away entire generations of God's people. Now certainly there were exceptions in the time of the judges. We read about a fellow named Othniel, the very first judge. We read about a woman named Deborah who judged Israel. We read about a, a Moabite woman named Ruth and her husband Boaz. And certainly those individuals, and no doubt several others as well, were exceptions to what the writer tells us. But by and large, the generation that came after Joshua and his contemporaries were swept away into apostasy. And not only was this something that happened shortly after the death of Joshua, but it's something that continued to happen down throughout Israel's history. In our Bible class, we have emphasized the fact that there's a cycle that repeats itself six different times in the book of Judges. God's people would go into sin. As a result, God would allow some foreign nation to bring them into servitude. And finally, God's people would cry out in supplication to God for deliverance. And God would raise up a judge to save his people. And then there would be a time of serenity or peace. And then the cycle started all over again. But God's people went into apostasy later on in their history. No doubt you remember that Saul, the first king of Israel, started out well. But eventually he wound up losing his kingdom because of his sins against God. David's son Solomon started out well, but he was led into apostasy by the foreign wives that he mentioned. And at his death, his kingdom divided north and south, and the ten northern tribes comprising the kingdom of Israel were eventually led away into captivity by the Assyrians in 722 B.C., and it was because of their sin against God. The southern kingdom of Judah, comprised of the tribes of Judah and Benjamin, survived for a while longer, but they eventually were carried away into captivity because of their sins against God. That Babylonian captivity lasted for 70 years, and then a remnant was allowed to come back to the, to the land, but even that returning remnant sinned against God as well. The New Testament makes it clear that the same kind of thing can happen among God's people today. Notice the warning that the Apostle Paul gave the Ephesian elders in Acts chapter 20 in verse 29 and 30. He said, For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also from among yourselves, men will rise up speaking perverse things to draw away <laughs> the disciples after themselves. Paul had spent three years laboring among the Ephesians. And he was concerned about the future of that church. And so, 
as he made his return to Jerusalem, he stopped in the port city of Miletus. He sent for the Ephesian elders to come to him and he issues this warning to those men. And he warns them that they need to be careful, they need to be on guard, they need to watch, they need to take heed to themselves, he says, and to all the flock over whom the Holy Spirit has made you overseers because Paul knew that later on savage wolves were going to come in and threaten the people of God. And Paul said, even from among yourselves, from among the eldership in the church at Ephesus, there would be those who would arise trying to take God's people away. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, <coughs> Paul told Timothy in verse 1 and verse 2, Now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron. If you've studied church history at all, you know that this kind of apostasy has manifested itself time and time again down through the centuries since the time of the apostles. Another lesson that I think we can learn from this passage is that godliness in one generation is no guarantee against apostasy in the next generation. We've already noted from verse 7 of Judges 2 that the people of God served God during the lifetime of Joshua and the elders who outlived him. But verse 10 says later on there was another generation that arose and they did not know God. In other words, they forsook God. They left God. They abandoned the teaching that their fathers and grandfathers had followed. The same thing has happened in many churches today. I'm talking about churches of Christ. It's happening in some churches of Christ today. And it could happen in this church if we don't heed the warnings of history. A third lesson that I see in this text is that apostasy can occur without losing all appearance of religion. Although the inspired writer tells us that the next generation did not know God, that doesn't mean that they stopped being religious. They were still doing religious kinds of things, and that should remind us that just being sincere in religion is not enough. We need to be sincere in the right religion. There's a lot of folks today who seem to have the idea that as long as we're sincere, God will accept whatever we want to offer Him. Well, folks, that wasn't true in the days of the judges, and it's not true today. Sincerity is essential. It is vitally important. God will not accept our worship and our service if it is not sincere, but sincerity alone is not enough. We need to sincerely do what God instructs us to do. 
And so just because somebody's religious doesn't necessarily mean that he's in a right relationship with God. And then another lesson that I see in this text is that every new generation is a potential generation for apostasy. Brethren, we can't assume that our children and our grandchildren will be faithful to God simply because they are our children or our grandchildren. It's possible for the younger folks in this church to grow up as a generation that does not know God. In fact, history testifies that most churches go into apostasy. Well, as you think about all of this, I think we need to think about what might have caused this. What might have contributed to the apostasy of this succeeding generation? And I would say to you that it happened because of negligence. And it may very well have happened because of negligence on the part of the priests. You see, God gave the priests under that Old Testament system the obligation to teach God's people His Word. Listen to what Moses says about that in Deuteronomy chapter 31. The writer of the book says, So Moses wrote this law and delivered it to the priests, the sons of Levi, who bore the ark of the covenant of the Lord and to all the elders of Israel. And Moses commanded them, saying, At the end of every seven years, at the appointed time in the year of release, at the Feast of Tabernacles, when all Israel comes to appear before the Lord your God in the place which he chooses, you shall read this law before all Israel in their hearing. And then Moses instructed his people, gather the people together, men and women and little ones, and the stranger who is within your gates, that they may hear and that they may learn to fear the Lord your God and carefully observe all the words of this law, and that their children who have not known it may hear and learn to fear the Lord your God as long as you live in the land which you cross the Jordan to possess. Would you not agree with me that if the priests failed to carry out their obligations, that they would have contributed to the apostasy that followed among God's people? The prophet Hosea talks about the failure of the priests in Israel. Now Hosea was prophesying many, many years after the time of the judges. And he tells us in Hosea chapter 4 that the priests in his day failed to do what God instructed them to do. In fact, he says in verse 6 of Hosea 4, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge because you, and he's addressing the priests here, because you have rejected knowledge, I also will reject you from being priest for me because you have forgotten the law of your God. I also will forget your children. Well, if the priests in the days of Hosea were held accountable for their negligence at that time, isn't it safe to conclude 
that if the priest neglected their responsibility in the time of the judges, that they would have been held accountable by, by God as well. And then negligence on the part of the elders may very well have contributed to this apostasy. Now, when we talk about elders here, we're talking about the leading men among the Jews who should have done their best to keep the people of God faithful to God. And if the elders in Israel failed to influence God's people towards God, we have to conclude that they would have contributed to Israel's apostasy. But then, of course, it may have been caused by negligence on the part of parents as well. In that famous Old Testament passage that the Jews call the Shema, Deuteronomy chapter 6, Beginning in verse 4, that text reads, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. If the parents in Israel during the time of the judges did not take that responsibility seriously, they contributed to the apostasy that followed. But folks, there's another group that we need to talk about, and that is the people themselves. God had told his people to take heed to themselves. In Deuteronomy chapter 4 and verse 9, listen to the words of Moses. Only take heed to yourself and diligently keep yourself, lest you forget the things your eyes have seen, and lest they depart from your heart all the days of your life, and teach them to your children and your grandchildren. Even if the priests and the elders and the parents neglected their duty, the people themselves should have desired and demanded that the law of God be kept. Well, what applications can we make to ourselves today? Well, I think this text teaches us that preachers and teachers of God's Word today must faithfully teach God's Word or share in the blame for any apostasy that might follow. Listen to what Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. I charge you, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. And then Paul went on to explain the time was going to come when God's people would heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. In other words, Paul says the time's coming when God's people, some of God's people, will try to find teachers and preachers that will tell them what they want to hear. One of my responsibilities as a gospel preacher is to remind you of things that you already know. 
There are so many New Testament passages that I could read to that effect. Let me just read one. Peter writes in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 12 and 13, For this reason I will not be negligent to remind you always of these things, though you know and are established in the present truth. Yes, I think it is right, as long as I am in this tent, to stir, up by, stir you up by reminding you. Peter understood that it's important for preachers to remind people of things even if they already know them and are established in them. Why do we need to be reminded? Well, if you're like me, it's because you forget. Why do we need to be reminded? Because sometimes our fervency and our intensity can wane. Have you noticed that in your life? But as a gospel preacher, I must teach younger people things that they don't know. Things that many older Christians have known for years. And that's not an easy task for a gospel preacher because there are some folks who have the idea, well, I already know all of this. I don't need to hear this anymore. I've had people tell me something like that. We already know these things. Well, that may be true. But do your kids and your grandkids know these things? And do new converts like Eric back there, do they know these things? Do your kids and your grandkids and new converts, do they understand how we establish Bible authority? Do they understand why this church does not use instruments of music in our worship to God? Do they understand why this church doesn't send money to support human institutions like colleges and orphans' homes? Do they understand why this church doesn't have a fellowship hall? Well, actually, that's a misstatement. We have a fellowship hall. We're sitting in it right now when you understand the biblical concept of fellowship. Do your kids and your grandkids and new converts, do they understand why this church doesn't support recreational activities? Why we don't send money to support a youth camp or why we don't have a church softball team? Do your kids and your grandkids understand those things? Have you taught them? And if you haven't taught them, who's going to teach them? Do you see my point? The fundamental truths of the gospel must be instilled in the minds and hearts of Christians, whether they are young or old, over and over again. Because if that's not done, apostasy will be the result. Unfortunately, Paul explains that it's possible for apostasy to occur even when the preacher does his job. 
listen to what Paul goes on to say in 2 Timothy 4, beginning in verse 3. I've already alluded to it. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. But you be watchful in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. Why do you suppose Paul told Timothy to be watchful and endure afflictions? Could it be that Paul knew that if a preacher does his job, he may be afflicted? by folks who don't want to hear the message. But folks, preachers who fail to teach the whole counsel of God must share part of the blame when apostasy comes. Notice what Paul told those Ephesian elders in Acts 20, verse 26 and 27. Therefore I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men, for I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. And then may I say to you that elders in local churches must faithfully oversee the church or they share in the blame when apostasy follows. Let me read the passage now that I alluded to a moment ago. Acts 20, verse 28 and 29. Therefore take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departure savage wolves will come in among you not sparing the flock. Elders contribute to eventual apostasy if they don't take their job seriously. If they ignore and condone sin in a local church. If they fail to do what they can do to edify the church. If they fail to lead and guide the church in the paths of righteousness. But then folks... Parents must personally teach their own children or, or they share in the blame when their children grow up and they don't know God. Parents must provide the right kind of example in life and in attitude. Parents must instill within their children high spiritual values. Sadly, many parents today in local churches instill within their children what I would call warped values. They teach their children, if not in words, but by their actions, that secular education is more important than spiritual education. For example, they insist that their kids do their homework for school, but they're not that concerned about whether they prepare to participate in a Bible class. Many parents teach their children, if not in words, in their actions, that athletics are more important than worshiping God. That overtime on the job is more important than church obligations. That recreation is more important than Bible study. The only biblical instruction that some children receive is whatever instruction they get here 
in the confines of these four walls. And when parents neglect to bring their children to Bible classes, what does that demonstrate? Let me tell you folks, if the only biblical teaching your kids get is what they get here, that's not enough. That's not going to get the job done. When parents fail to teach their children, that often results in young members of a local church who are only half converted. And that eventually results in a church whose adult members are only half converted. But then we must say that Christians as individuals must be faithful to Christ or they become part of an apostate generation. Paul told the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 15, 58, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. If everybody else, the preacher, the elders, the parents, if everybody else fails in carrying out their responsibility, I must not fail to be faithful to the Lord. And I can't excuse my negligence because others have failed. Now, it's certainly true that none of us as individuals can guarantee that the next generation will be faithful to God. But we must do whatever we can do to keep apostasy from happening. And if we all do our part, isn't it more likely that the next generation will not go into apostasy. As we conclude our study this morning, let me ask you a couple of questions. What have you been doing to keep this church from departing from the Lord and going into apostasy? when the older generation in this church is replaced by the next generation? Second question, what will you do in the future? Will you support solid gospel preaching? Will you encourage the leaders in this church Will you teach the younger generation? Will you set the kind of example that you should? What happened way back yonder in the time of the judges, what has happened in many churches today, doesn't have to happen to this church. And it's our responsibility to do all that we can do to keep it from happening. How sad are the words that there was a generation that arose in Israel that knew not God. Well, I hope you'll take this lesson home with you and that you'll think about it and you'll think about 
how you can help this church remain faithful to the Lord. Of course, everything begins when one makes the decision to become a Christian, when one decides to follow Jesus. And if you've not made that decision, we want to give you an opportunity to do that. And we stand ready to help you in any way that we can. You can respond to the gospel now as we stand and sing together.